Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of HR Power Hour, where we at EOS HR Consulting share some of our knowledge with you. Today, we're going to be talking about how to identify and assist employees at risk for self-harm. My name is Suzanne Crest, and I'm the newest consultant on the EOS HR Consulting team. Um, I've worked in a variety of industries. I've got about a little over 15 years of experience doing HR, and I'm very pleased to be able to offer this video to you since one of my passions is promoting mental health in the workplace. Today's agenda. We're going to be going over some statistics and COVID-19 trends, get into details about mental health, employees' mental health, talk about why we're not talking about it, going over a suicide risk model, talking about your role as a supervisor in watching for indicative behaviors. I will share with you the script. We'll talk about taking further action and of course preventing further issues at work and then just go over some points to remember. So to start off with some statistics, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. Someone dies by suicide every 12 minutes. Suicide is at its highest level since the 1940s. And for the first time in recent generations, overall life expectancy is decreasing due to suicide. For every death by suicide, there are an average of 30 suicide attempts. 90% of those who died by suicide had a diagnosable, treatable mental health condition at the time of their death. Women attempt suicide 1.5 times more often than men, but there are 3.6 male suicide deaths for every female death by suicide. And firearms account for half of all suicide deaths. Again, we just said that suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. With this chart, you can see that we're making progress on leading causes of death, such as heart disease, cancer, stroke. But for some reason, suicide is trending in the wrong direction. We are not making headway. And later in this presentation, we're going to be speaking about Dr. Thomas Joyner. But right now, I'd like to share a quote with him that I think puts this into perspective. He says, people who kill themselves are influenced in doing so by mental illnesses. And these illnesses themselves are widely misunderstood. But make no mistake, they are forces of nature. They're grave, they're severe, just like heart disease, cancer, and stroke. They kill people every year. Finally, with this chart, I wanted to show you, again, the trending upwards over the last 10 years um, of suicide in the United States. And you can see most alarmingly that is quite an uptick in the 15 to 24 year old range. Oh, I also wanted to share with you, I'm sorry that I forgot, suicide is the second leading cause of death amongst Americans aged 10 through 34. Not the 10th, the second. And again, that can be reflected in, by this uptick on this chart. I wanted to go over some COVID-19 trends and I read an article in Forbes um, published in August of 2020. And here are just a couple of quotes from that article. Millions of Americans have lost their jobs. They've watched helplessly as their savings dwindled away, as they were confined to their homes prohibited from interacting with friends, attending church, temple, or music and sporting events. This has resulted in a profound impact on the mental health and emotional well-being of people, leading to a significant increase in cases of anxiety, depression, and death by suicide. 
Economic stress, social isolation, and overall national anxiety increased firearm sales and healthcare worker suicides. And we're seeing, sadly, far greater suicides now than we are deaths from COVID-19. Well-regarded public health entities, such as the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, CDC, uh, Prevention's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly, Weekly Report, and the World Health Organization, all point out that our mental health is languishing. And they've issued warnings about the possible effects of COVID-19 on suicidal behaviors. In addition, a major research study concluded that the United Nations and, and the World Health Organization contend that it's important to enhance their focus on mental health matters, including suicide prevention. These organizations assert suicide is likely to become a more pressing concern as the pandemic spreads. Finally, I wanted to share some data with you from a CDC survey conducted in June of 2020. Of that cohort, 25.5% of respondents between the ages of 18 and 24 say they've considered suicide in the last 30 days due to the pandemic. 11% of all adults surveyed had seriously considered suicide in the past 30 days. 19% of Hispanics and 15% of Blacks reported suicidal thoughts in the past 30 days. Over 30% of all of the respondents said they had symptoms of anxiety or depression. And 26.3% reported trauma and stress-related disorders caused by the outbreak. The amount of Americans reporting anxiety symptoms is triple the number at this time last year. So why aren't we talking about it? Well, let's start by doing a guided imagery exercise. This is to kind of bring us to the present moment uh, and think through some of the, the topics that we're going to talk through. So I would just like to take a few moments to ask you to, to think about creating a caring workplace environment. So if you could please close your eyes and just focus on your breathing for a few minutes to enter the present moment. We're trying to be mindful at this moment. Now I'd like you to think back to a time when you experienced a personal crisis of some kind. Remember how you felt during this time. Where in your body did you feel the impact of the situation? And what was going through your mind? Now I'd like you to remember if there was anyone who was especially helpful to you during this difficult time. What did they say or do to be helpful? How were they helpful? Now I'd like you to remember someone who was not helpful to you during this time, or maybe even harmful to you. What did they say or do? How were they not helpful or even harmful? Now, please open your eyes. I hope this exercise puts us all in a, a good-minded, compassionate state of mind. Um, so when people are struggling in their personal lives, as we just went through an exercise that shows that at some point you probably did, they don't leave their struggles at the door. It all comes with them and it can temporarily impact their work lives. People don't have the ability to just say, I'm gonna leave that at home today, especially when you're talking about these major issues. So it's not just at home, where suicide affects everyone in the workplace, and the impact of suicide and related mental health crises are widespread. The workplace is a critical venue for suicide prevention. 
With training, employees at all levels of an organization can learn to detect the signs of suicide and have a plan of action in place. Overall, employee mental health is important to realize. An estimated 85% of employees' mental illnesses go undiagnosed or untreated. One in 14 employees will suffer from depression at some point. This equals 200 million lost workdays and $44 billion annually in absenteeism, lost productivity, and direct treatment costs. More Americans suffer from depression than coronary heart disease, cancer, and AIDS combined. And we mentioned this before, but at least 90% of all people who die by suicide have a mental health condition, most commonly depression. So why did I decide to talk to you guys about this today? Well, again, I've been in HR for about 15 years and about five or six years ago, I received a phone call from a nurse at a hospital who said that one of my employees had asked her to call me to let me know she wouldn't be able to come to work that day. And I think she must have said something like, well, she's here by herself or alone because when I hung up the phone, I decided to immediately drive over to the hospital. It's about a 10 minute drive. And when I arrived at the hospital, I let them know who I was there to see and they just took me straight back to see her. She was in fact alone. I just stood next to her while watching her go in and out of sleep. When she was out of sleep, she told me that she had taken a bottle of pills and washed it down with alcohol. But that upon feeling those effects, those first effects of that combination, she decided to call 911 on herself. When I talked to her later on about this day, she said that it was comforting to see me there every time she woke up. And she was relieved that she wasn't alone and could finally get some rest. Her partner did arrive later on that day. But later, I had some guilt about going to visit her. Did I cross the line from HR lady to friend? This is a question that HR professionals and supervisors often ask themselves. Where do you cross the line? Well, I've kept in touch with this former employee of mine, and I recently spoke to her on the phone. She says she is still fighting depression, and only a few close friends know about her struggles. Not her family, and not anyone at work. And her current job in healthcare is filled with triggers for her depression but she doesn't feel comfortable talking to her boss or any of her coworkers about these struggles. She told me if somebody, if somebody at work cared about her, if she felt that way and helped her, then she would feel like it was okay to talk about these struggles and she would have some job security, which is a huge relief because she doesn't want to bring up some struggles she's having and then have her job be in jeopardy and then not be able to pay the bills anymore. And she just doesn't have that in her current work environment. So we're going to talk about the suicide risk model by Dr. Thomas Joyner, who I quoted earlier in the presentation. Dr. Joyner is a professor of psychology at Florida State University and he's a leading expert on suicide. He's written a couple books on the subject. Um, and he knows that many of us have developed a series of beliefs about what kind of people decide to kill themselves and why. Like, that's the coward's way out. That's selfish. That's an act of revenge. Or maybe it's just a cry for help or just something you've decided to do impulsively. Well, Dr. Joyner believes that all of those assumptions are wrong. And we can better understand the who, how, why, when of folks who are going through these difficult thoughts, and then we can do a better job to prevent suicide. 
So he has introduced the internet interpersonal theory of suicide. So this is a, a three part Venn diagram and it focuses on these three parts. So which include belongingness, burdensomeness, and the means to be able to commit suicide. So when these three pieces connect, you, that is the spot where lethal or near lethal suicide attempts happen. You could still have that desire for suicide if you feel thwarted belongingness or perceived burdensomeness, which we'll go over in a moment, but once you add the capability to die by suicide, whether it's a gun or researching how to hang yourself, um, then we are in the area of folks who are attempting to die by suicide. So how do we apply this model at the workplace? It, let me, even though it's you know, thwarted belongingness and perceived burdensomeness, it's actually very simple. At work, you either feel like you belong or you don't. So when people feel like they don't belong, it's usually after a, a negative performance review, maybe their expectations, your expectations of them are too high, or maybe they're going through some disciplinary action. Sometimes they feel like they don't belong when their friend quits, or I've I'll seen an uptick in this with pe more people working from home because maybe they felt like they belonged in the workplace in the workplace, but now that they're not around their peers, maybe they are feeling like they don't belong. And then perceived burdensomeness. This is when an employee feels like they're a burden on you, your company. Um, they know maybe that their poor performance is bringing others down. Um, they feel like a burden because they're disappointing their boss. And again, one thing I've seen recently is when you're on an important call, a Zoom call, Google Meet, with your peers, and your internet goes out all of a sudden, you just, you feel like you're a burden on everybody on that call, because now they have to wait for you to reconnect, or maybe we have to reschedule the meeting. And so that's another way that somebody could feel like they're a burden. Your role as a supervisor. You are well positioned to notice if your employees are struggling and take the first steps in insisting them to get help. You spend a lot of time at work, at work, and have day-to-day -day contact with your employees. And you get to know them over time and they may, and you see them at critical points in their lives. You can observe changes in their behavior. Now, deaths by suicide can come out of the blue from people who outwardly seem like they're doing okay, functioning normally, but remember, inward, they are in desperate misery. However, there are some indicative behaviors we might see from those folks that can clue us into how they're feeling truly, such as if they're talking about feeling trapped, talking about being a burden to others, if you sense that they're increasing the use of alcohol or drugs, if they're acting anxious or agitated, if they sleep too much, or if, they're, if they tell you they're getting very little sleep, um, they talk about seeking revenge and you, they might display extreme mood swings. Now, please remember, you are not the expert. You're not expected to be a therapist. This is a tool for you to use, but please leave a comprehensive suicide risk assessment up to professionally trained health providers. But you do care. Much like performing CPR on someone before the ambulance arrives with the EMT, you should feel empowered to ask tough questions about suicide. It should, it should feel the same. I can, you would definitely think about doing CPR you should definitely think about asking someone about what they're going through. And please remember, asking about suicide does not put the idea in their head if it wasn't there before. There are studies that clearly show this. Even if it feels uncomfortable, having a conversation with someone, in this case, your coworker, your employee, could save their life. 
So what we are providing to you today is the script. This is a very hard thing to do. It's taboo to even talk about death by suicide. But because I know that we can prevent suicide in the workplace, I want you to learn how to, to read this script, say the script when you talk to someone. The first thing you're going to tell them is, I am concerned about you. And you're going to get straight to the point and ask, given what you're going through, it would be understandable if you were thinking about suicide. And I'm wondering if this is true for you. At this point, maybe the employee just laughs it off. They're like, oh, you're crazy. What are you talking about? And that's the end of the conversation. Even that little piece could help that person in the long run. But if they do open up to you, then ask them to tell you more about their thoughts about suicide or anything that they're struggling with. And then just listen. This is not the time to give advice. Just listen. When they're finished, you're going to say, thank you for trusting me. And I am on your team. You are not alone. And finally, I have some resources that might help. If you believe someone may be in danger of suicide imminently, call 911, absolutely. And you wanna stay with that person or at least make sure they're in a safe place until further help can come. You can contact your employee assistance program and EAP or HR department so they can help you decide what to do. But if you don't have access to an EAP or HR, contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which I will show you in a moment. And then make sure to follow up, maintain contact, find out if they're getting the help that they need. Just being able to let somebody know that they can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline might be enough to help someone. So anyone can call, anyone can go online. Their phone number is 1-800-273-8255 or talk. Even if you can't think of any other resources to give that person at that time, let them know about this. It's 24 seven with licensed professionals who can help anyone with any crisis that they're having. So how do we prevent suicide in the workplace? Well, you develop policies that promote mental health. You wanna reassure your employees that mental health problems are real and treatable. Offer mental health education programs or apps. I've seen a lot of great apps right now that uh, can connect you to a licensed therapist uh, and you pay a monthly fee or maybe it's through your healthcare provider. Um, go ahead and refer employees to your employee assistance program or and or HR. Create a work environment that fosters communication, a sense of belonging and respect. And provide frequent positive feedback. And finally, consider reasonable accommodations. Sometimes we're too quick to judge someone who says, well, you know, I need to, if I could just come to work at nine instead of eight in the morning, that would be a huge help to me. Okay. Why would that be such a big deal? That's a pretty easy accommodation to make for someone. So what I want us all to remember, remember suicide is the only leading cause of death in the United States that is trending in the wrong direction but it is preventable. Someone who feels like they don't belong and they're a burden on someone may start to have thoughts of self-harm. And be direct. Suicide should be discussed in a straightforward manner, even if it's difficult or uncomfortable. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation. I hope these tips will help you um, in your effort to prevent suicide in the workplace. And um, please feel free to email us at hreoshr.com if you have any further questions. And you can also call us at the number below. Thank you so much. Have a great day.